this is Scott Becker with the Becker Private Equity Business Podcast. Thrilled today to be joined by a brilliant athlete and leader and author. We're joined today by Heather Moyce. For those of you who don't know Heather, Heather's an Olympic gold medalist. She's also written a book called Redefining Realistic, Shift Your Perspective, Seize Your Potential, Own Your Story. She talks about several different subjects, and we're so excited to visit with Heather today. Heather, I'm obviously, you're in Canada. I am such a provincial, small-minded American. <laughs> Do me a favor. Tell us about yourself. Tell us about Heather Moss. I, I've got a brilliant background introduction on you, but I don't know you. Tell us about yourself, please. Okay, well, I, my name is Heather Moyes. I grew up in a very, in a very small place. I grew up in Prince Edward Island, which is off the east coast of Canada. So northeast of Maine. It is the smallest province in Canada. It's only accessible by a plane or a 13 kilometer bridge, which was actually a ferry when I was growing up for a boat ride. Um, so it was pretty remote. So what I love about my story is that I came at sports um, in this athletic career later in life because Olympians were TV people for me. So uh, they, you know, they weren't ordinary people like I considered myself to be growing up. So I wasn't surrounded by people trying to achieve these high level of performance or high levels really in anything. So you kind of are just what I've realized over the years is that we limit our choice. We all think we're making choices and we are. But we limit our choices based on the boundaries of our direct environment and our and our direct exposures. And that is how we define what's possible in our lives instead of looking beyond what is immediately in front of us. And so that's what I love about what I do now. So I didn't actually start sports until I, well, I played sports my whole life, but I didn't start training for sports or taking it seriously until I was 27. And it was when I was 27 that I was suddenly faced with the challenge of seeing if I could learn a new sport learn to do it well and learn to do it well in time to compete for my country, for Canada at the next Olympics. And those next Olympics were less than five months later. So that was the challenge that I took on. It wasn't even the sport I fell in love with. It was this challenge of seeing if I could, you know, do this seemingly implausible thing and actually represent my country in less than five months time. So that's what got me into bobsledding. And for me, it's, it's, uh, I have a master's degree in occupational therapy. And so even though I'm a, not a practicing occupational therapist now, all of my education and training as an occupational therapist combined with my years in high performance sport and dealing with performing under high pressure situations and, you know, managing the ins and outs and all of that stuff, combining those two, um, I guess, aspects of my life or credentials of my life is what helps me now with my business. Heather, take, take a moment take a moment here because Tim Ferriss writes a lot about this concept of what it takes to become great at something in a short period of time. And you obviously became, I mean, bobsledding is not, is in Canada is I take it a competitive, seriously competitive sport. It's not like you're trying to make the bobsled team like famously was done in the, with the Jamaican bobsled team. You're in an, you're in a sport where even if there's not, everybody competes in bobsledding, but there's enough competition to make it a serious thing. What does it take to become good at something in a short period of time? Because we're always a believer. Once somebody knows how to become an expert in something, it doesn't make an, an expert in other things, but it gives them an, an understanding of what it might take to become an expert in other things, which are two very different things than becoming an expert in it. But what does it take to become great in something in a short period of time? What kind of devotion? What kind of training? What kind of energy? What kind of doing things smart as well as putting a lot of time into it? What does it take? Yeah, well, I think like I'm also, I mean, I've played on the national women's rugby team for years too, and those are sort of, I won't say they're transferable. All of the skills are not transferable. Some of them are, but when I'm talking to groups, I mean, I speak to organizations and associations and corporations all over the world. And um, the reason why I'm being called in to ask is not just to tell my story and, and, oh, that's a cool story, but it's actually because my messaging is transferable and relatable to, to most, well, to anybody, because the qualities it takes to be successful in any occupation or industry are the same qualities it takes to be successful in sports. Now, obviously I'm not, I'm not talking about the specific skills, like the very technical minutia of, you know, what you need to do to execute, like to do your job. Um, but the qualities in terms of the ability to manage, like successfully manage change and face challenges 
and overcome the obstacles that will inevitably pop up along the way, because that is often what stops people is these obstacles. But if you assume that you're going to have obstacles along the way, then they don't come as a surprise. It's just a matter of brainstorming, um, thinking outside the box. I talk a lot about um, a gamifying, uh, like gamifying your goals, gamifying your life. Um, nobody stops playing a video game after they their three men have fallen off the cliff. They just try again. They try a different route. They try different, having different armor on. They try different tactics. They try different weapons, whatever they're going to do. They try a different path. Um, they try again and again and again. And if we actually did and, that. And you said, but to talk about this for a second, because you, you said something I think resonates that the concept that the qualities become good at something are the specific skills may be different, but the qualities become good at something, whether it's a profession, a business, a sport, those qualities may be the same. We might have more proclivities to some versus the other, but talk about those qualities are that allowed you in five months yeah. after not really being a bobsledder to become great at bobsledding. What, I mean, obviously you're naturally probably a pretty good athlete. If you're playing the women's, you know, mm -hmm. the Canadian national rugby team, you're, you're, you have a proclivity for athletics and probably like it much easier for somebody who's already naturally athletically talented to become that, to reach a higher potential in it. But talk about those qualities that, went into five months being great at something. What does that take? Because a lot of us would like to learn that and do that in other areas of our life. Yeah, for sure. So basically, as I sort of mentioned, they would be the qualities that it takes to successfully manage change, face challenge, and, and overcome these obstacles. And basically, in my how I set them is it's not so much at looking at a goal as being a binary outcome, like you succeeded or you failed. And I think that's where we we go wrong in society. We have these, we set these goals. We're told to set goals and we should set goals, but we have these as these binary outcomes instead of looking at it like a spectrum and just challenging yourself, embracing it more like a challenge to see how close you can get. And then that way you're actually going to discover what you're truly capable of. If you set these goals really high and you just, it puts you automatically in a solution, solution minded mental state where you're like looking for solutions because you just want to see you want to see how can I challenge myself to see how close I can get and the closer you get the more you realize it's possible the other things would be perspective keeping things in perspective and sometimes that means if you are if this is a, a performance oriented goal like performing at the Olympics for example um, instead of just an outcome goal then it would mean sometimes figuring out those optimal levels of adrenaline that you have and figuring out where your optimal level is to get your optimal level of performance out. And this could be the same thing as, you know, trying to land the biggest client of your life, you know, trying to get this big account and you could be the most knowledgeable in this area. You could have invented this entire thing and know the ins and outs of all of it. But all of a sudden, when it comes down to like this pressure and the stress of being able to, you know, relay this information to a huge client in order to land them sometimes people will just forget what they're forget like a key component they will um, not be able to speak the throat will dry up like all of these different things so that's the same as in sports where when it comes down to these high pressure situations you need to be able to control those levels of adrenaline so that you can perform you need to keep things it, under perspective downplay the, it, 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 the event and let's talk about those things right now, because you've mentioned sure. something that resonates with me so much, <laughs> Heather, and I'll talk to you, and I feel like I should be on the therapist's couch right now, because I'll tell you my two problems, okay? okay? Yeah. One problem is I'll, I'll be having a, you know, I'm a very mid-level handicap golfer. I'll be at having a near record round. I'll get down to the last couple holes, and getting close to a record round will peak my anxiety, peak my energy, and I'll mess up on the last few holes because I've tried too hard, because I can't get the, I can't make it work. Similarly, I coach high school tennis, have for years, played serious tennis. And then once in a while, I'll get in a match and I feel like, oh my God, I just can't serve. I can't serve today. I know what I have to do. I need to spin it. I need to make it work. It doesn't have to be great. And I'll just almost have a mental or physical block on those last couple holes or as I'm trying to serve under pressure. And, and one of my partners who is a, a rugby player who plays tennis too, would, would, would say how true this is and resonates with him so much. And I know you're a rugby player and I, and I, I needed to make sure he was mentioned for a moment. So that's a <laughs> shout out to him. But, but tell me, why do we deal with those moments of pressure where I'm like, I know what I have to do. I just need to ask you in these last few holes. I've gotten so much better at the game. 
I just have to spin the serve and make it go. And how do I deal with that anxiety, you know, w- without taking an anti-anxiety drug to get me through those moments? How do I deal with that? Or how does yeah. someone deal with that stress? Yeah. So you just, you kind of just pointed it out without actually realizing you're pointing it out. Um, the it's funny because I actually coached I had a client about two and a half years ago who was a golfer and I had to make it very clear to him that I said I don't golf like I can't make your golf swing better but I can make you be able to execute your golf whatever you're able to execute so when it comes down to performance it is there are different people have different um, theories on how it's divided but And it basically comes down to when you're competing at a certain level, 10% of it is based on your physical skill, your physical ability to execute whatever skills you have. That's 10% of the, of the actual performance. The other 90% is your mental toughness, your mental strength, your mental ability to execute. And that 90%, wherever you fall on there is your ability to execute your 10%. So we hear about people you know, cracking under pressure all the time. And, you know, the best in the world, the best perform, the best athlete in the world all of a sudden gets to the Olympics and doesn't perform there and just makes mistakes they've never made before. And that's because they've cracked under pressure. And that's because they might be a 10 out of 10 in physical ability, but they might have be a 30, like a 30 out of 90 um, for their ability to execute those physical skills under pressure. And so that's exactly what you're talking about when you're talking about your golf and you're coming down to the last couple holes and or the tennis where you you know what you have to do. And part of that is you have to take the stress and pressure away. And part of that is with perspective. And part of that is almost tricking your mind. For example, rewording things in your brain. Like you said, I have to make this shot. I have to make this shot. And you don't have to make anything. Like if you come down to it, you just, you need to remind yourself that you're like, I don't have to do this. I can literally walk off the field, like off the course right now. I could walk off the court right now. I don't have to be here. I don't have to be here. I actually want to be here. Like I want to do this. I I actually want to hit this really well. But as soon as we start, we automatically, everyone does it. We automatically start saying, oh my gosh, I have to make this. Well, no, you actually don't. You don't have to be there at all. So if by reminding yourself that you want to do it, it changes the whole your, your, your posture changes, your feeling changes, your, your demeanor changes. You just, you want to do it. And then if you also downplay the importance of the event, um, you can just like for the Olympics, for example, I had to convince myself that it was just like, it just a normal race. This is, I'm playing, I'm playing against the same people. I've been on this track before. It's not a big deal. It's just, it's just a race. Like, it's just a race. My family is still going to love me regardless of, you know, whether it come first, second, third, or 10th, like, that it doesn't, it doesn't matter like that. Those things don't matter. So by kind of playing with those different ideas, you have to find out what works for you. For some people, it's the music no. you listen to. Some people have to listen to classical music before doing an event to kind of bring that adrenaline level back down. Um, and some people before an event, they're kind of are flat. They might have to listen to pump up music and, and pump themselves back up. But does that make sense to you? Does that resonate at all? I mean, a hundred percent. And it is still challenging because you find yourself so mentally strong in other parts of your life, and then find yourself in a couple of things that you want to do well, just for whatever reason you want to do well at it. Mm-hmm. And, and you find yourself unable to perform at that moment. And you're just like, oh my God, how did that happen? And, and a lot of it is putting yourself in the right mental state. It's a fascinating perspective. Heather, take a moment on, we're getting to the second half of 2023. You're, yeah. you're an internationally acclaimed rugby player. You're an Olympic gold medalist. You're an author. You, you coach people. What are you most excited about and most focused on as we get to the second half of this year? Yeah, so most of my business is, I, I, speaking, I would say, is mo- the primary part of my business. Um, I usually only coach two or three people at a time because it's more like a retainer basis. It's more um, flexible and and really highly accessible to me. So I need, I need it to be flexible with my schedule, with their schedule. And I also don't feel like I've always been that square peg that people are trying to shove into round holes. And so I don't believe there's a one size fits all for programs. Um, but what I'm really excited about is, um, that things are starting to pick up now a little bit more. I mean, things were flattened out a little bit with COVID. So things are picking up a lot more now, and I'm finally um, getting things planned and put in place to start some retreats next year. So I'm really excited about that, and it's been a long time coming, and I'm, yeah, I'm really, I'm really excited about that, um, adding that to my business. What is 
does the retreat what does a retreat look like? What does that look like? I mean, it, it, it strikes me that with someone like you, it'd be hardly a retreat. You'd be bobsledding, you'd be rugby, you'd be I mean, it would be a, a very physically challenging <laughs> retreat. Tell us what that retreat actually looks like in in reality. That is really that's <laughs> that's great to know. That means I have to market things much differently so people actually know what it would be like. Um, retreats with me, uh, I think that part of why I was able to man- do so many things throughout my life was that I had almost like a built-in retreat, a built-in um, respite, I should say, from from life, like from the noise. Um, and I also think right now people struggle. Uh, some of my, a lot of my clients actually would be pretty successful people like looking in, but they're, they feel like something's missing in their life or they don't feel fulfilled or they might seem outwardly successful, but they're not, something's missing. They're, they're not doing something in their life that's actually bringing them joy. Um, so they wouldn't consider themselves successful necessarily. So though that's a, th- those are a lot of my clients. And I think that a lot of times we're setting goals in life based on what society views as being important and not what we actually want. And I sometimes think that, well, I know that we often don't even know what we really want. We're kind of swayed on this autopilot and with momentum. And so <clears throat> people's kind of mental health is struggling a little bit, especially when they get to these points of, you know, outward success or material success or status or whatever. And they still don't, there's still something missing. It's because that's what we have to try and figure out. So part of these retreats, there's one that's specifically on kind of like really workshopping and masterminding and um, working through, like they come in knowing exactly what they want and we'll break that down and they'll leave kind of with this roadmap um, of how to get from point A to point B, like figuring out all of that stuff. Cause some people just struggle a little bit with being able to see the path to get there. Um, and the other one, the primary one is almost more like a disconnect to reconnect. So stepping away from the noise, the expectations, the opinions, and the values of other people, and actually completely disconnecting to like reconnect with your own values, with what's really important to you, and then figure out how you can embed that and insert that and and mold your life around that. And all of these retreats will be destination retreats because I want to combine that with my love for travel and exploring and discovering new cultures. So it's going to be kind of a balance of just having a really cool travel experience, but with sessions inserted throughout to work on the things that might bring them joy and fulfillment when they go back home. So, so, so cool. So tell us where one of the destination treats are, where they'll be at, just to give people a sort of an inkling of how fun that would be. Well, I actually have a scout who's searching out locations right now. Um, so not exactly sure where the next one's going to be. Um, we're looking at places like Costa Rica. We're trying to figure out whether the first one will be in North America or Central America or Caribbean, like this side of the world, or whether we'll take it over to Europe and possibly do, um, Morocco, Portugal, um, somewhere in Italy, um, something like that. So I'm looking at having probably two retreats every year, one in the kind of winter spring from February, March, or April, and then another one in October, um, October, November, and those, so probably one will be on this side of the world and one will be on the other side of the world. And that way it'll be a different location every year and people can possibly use this as an opportunity to just kind of renew themselves, you know, January, February, March, and kind of get the rest of the year kicked off on a really good, on a good foot. So, so yeah, I'm super excited. So people just have to possibly, you know, follow on Instagram or, or sign up on my website just to kind of keep those that information going if they're interested. And yes. Yeah, so and, and tell us, Heather, Heather, let me ask you that question. That that let me lead into that question. Where do people learn more about Heather Moise? Or if you want to hire Heather Moise either for to, to go on one of your retreats or for coaching, executive leadership coaching, whatever it might be. Heather, where do people learn more about you? Yeah. So my website's just heathermoise.com. Um, if you ever forget my last name, you can just look up Heather Canada bobsleigh or Heather or Heather Canada rugby, and you know it'll come up somewhere. But my Instagram handle is Heather Moise. My Facebook handle is Heather Moise. Um, if someone's trying to get in touch with me, social media is usually not the easiest because I mean I try to get to all those messages that come in. But if something you know, if I post something and I have an influx, sometimes those requests get lost. So I really encourage people to kind of reach out through the website. 
and it's just heathermoist.com or even the direct email, you can either do hello or heather at heathermoist.com and the email will come through and yeah, we can definitely get information to people. Phenomenal. Heather, amazing what you've accomplished. What a pleasure to get a chance to visit with you. Congratulations on your book, on your success, Olympic gold medals, an amazing career. Uh, So much to learn. And and I'll work on my mental toughness because I need it. Thank you so much for joining us. (laughs) Scott, thanks so much for having me on. It's been great.